Uh, hi, my name is Irvi, and it is great to be attending Netroots with you this year. It is a little bit different, and I understand that, you know, it's going to be a little harder than maybe it has been in previous years. Um, I am somebody who got into grant writing somewhat by accident, and the reason I did get into grant writing is that I found that it was a really effective way to get the organization I worked with funding in a way that helped us meet our engineering objectives. Now, it was a private company, so the specifics of the types of grants that we applied for may differ from the types of grants that you have applied for or that you might consider applying for, but there are some commonalities in all types of grants that if I had known early on would have helped me a lot because there, when you're approaching a grant project, the value of the grant project is not just the money that you get, it's also the process of alignment with your organization, clarifying your values, and how you approach the actual contract in a way that leads to success. So just to get started, I'm gonna let you know what we're gonna talk about so there's no real surprises, but we also do have a Q&A and feel free to drop your questions in because if you drop your questions in, I will try to get to them all. And if you've got lingering questions, I will share my email at the end. You can always email me. I'm happy to share knowledge with folks in this movement. Uh, yeah, just a technical note for folks about questions. Um, there's, uh, if you look at the bottom pane, there, there's a chat window and that's just a general chat. And there's also a Q&A function. If you have a question that you would like, like everybody to answer uh, live, then please put it in the Q&A box. Uh, but feel free to use the chat uh, window as well, just for other things that you might feel like saying. Um, and make sure if you want everyone to see it, that it is uh, selected to all panelists and attendees and not just all panelists. If it's panelists, then only Irving and I will see it. Yeah. And I might not see it as well because I've got this screen open already. So if you want to make sure that you get our attention in real time, Q&A, best way to. So what we're going to talk about today, we've got the basic definitions in the background of what is a grant how to evaluate the project fit, the things that you need to do to set yourself up for success. Because if you don't do those things in advance, they can be really problematic. We're gonna talk about how to write for grant grading and also making sure that you're going to get some value out of the process, even if you don't win, because it does take a lot of time. And if you don't do the things to make sure your time was well spent, then it can be both really disheartening as well as a suck of resources out of your organization as opposed to a way to pull resources into your organization. So very basic thing, a grant is a non-refundable project where you get funds from somebody else and you don't have to pay it back. And it's not the same as normal business relationships where I might sell something to you because in a grant, I might give you money and I expect you to do something um, to achieve a specific outcome and maybe tell me what it is you're doing, but I'm not actually getting anything directly from you. So if you're normally thinking about grants, they are a type of contract, you know, they are a legal structure to distribute money. And it's not quite the same as a donation because a donation, you know, if I give money to a political candidate, I have no real expectation of they're now going to do a specific thing for me. They don't actually have to report back to me what they did or why. Um, whereas if it's a grant, when they accept that check, they are also accepting some responsibilities. And so it's kind of important to think about that, but also to note that there are benefits compared to other funding mechanisms. So if you're a private company and you are getting investments from you know, a venture capitalist, you're probably going to give them a share of ownership in your company or project. And that can change the ownership structure, the accountability structure. Whereas on grants, you might be accountable for sharing information and making sure you're doing that in a timely manner to continue receiving checks. But fundamentally, the ownership of that project doesn't normally change. So if you end up needing to leave, and I could leave you with only one takeaway, the absolute most important thing you should do is read the instructions before you start. And I'm gonna say that again, read the instructions before you start. Because one of the things that people tend not to think about in our movement is when you're an activist, you're often seeking to disrupt power structures 
And so you don't necessarily need to play by the rules. You can change things. Um, civil disobedience, going outside the lines is perfectly acceptable. With a grant, if you do not respond to the actual criteria in front of you, it does not matter how good your project is. You will not win the project if you do not respond to the criteria that they're looking at. And you'd be amazed at how much of a difference this can make. So there was once about five years ago when I was pretty new in grant writing and I was at a company that had 30 people at the time, and we were seeking to partner with a larger company on a technology development project. And one of their senior VPs who had about two decades more experience than me said, we want to do the project in this specific way. Now, I told him we can't do that um, because this particular grant had restrictions on what could and could not be done. And I was like, you know, that might be an interesting project. It will not work for this solicitation. Uh, and this gentleman with a lot more experience than me said, well, if you're not willing to do it this way, we'll do it with someone else. And they went to another company. They applied for the same grant with that proposal. And they did not even reach the scoring mechanism because you have to score high enough to get a full review. And at face value, they did not meet the criteria. They were automatically rejected. We went forward with a project that did meet the criteria. And not only did we win, we got several million dollars to complete that project. Now, this man and his team of over 700 people did something very dumb in my opinion, which was they did not read the instructions. They did not respect the instructions as an explicit direction as to what to do. That little action completely changes their ability to succeed in the project. And I might've been much younger and had less experience, but I read the instructions. That basic thing will give you a huge competitive advantage over everybody who kind of phones it in. And if you are applying for government grants, um, which the majority of grants that folks access are in fact government grants, they will document exactly what you need to do. They will have a scoring mechanism, which will tell you what is the breakdown of points. They will tell you literally everything you need to know. And you know, for private foundations, you can research what are they doing? What does their portfolio look like? They might not be as explicit in telling you what they want, but they will generally have enough documents that you can glean that information if you read up on it. And so the other thing to think about is in those instructions, the things that might seem really minor are key scoring criteria. So for example, when I was applying for a grant at the California Energy Commission several years back, they said specifically, you need to use this font and margin when applying. If you did not do that, it was a really easy way for the grader to just open it, look, oh, this is the wrong font, close it, not have to read 200 pages because they know you can't follow instructions. And if they're going to give you a lot of money, they wanna know that you can follow instructions because if you can't, then you will not be a good partner to them. And so it might seem silly to you that like, okay, I wanted to use Arial instead of Times New Roman. Well, they set an instruction and before they give you money, they wanna know you can follow instructions. And so if they're giving you these instructions, respect that. It is a huge way to show that you are actively listening. And this is an example that I just grabbed earlier this week. There's a, a sustainable transportation equity project in California. And you can see the solicitation documents that they list include, here's your acronyms and definitions. Here's a project template, the proposal components, the scoring criteria, the eligibility, all of these documents, they list out specifically because they fundamentally want you to succeed and they want to get the best project to spend public dollars on. Now, you might not get that from a private sector once again, but a lot of the times, if you look at you know a corporation's um, corporate sustainability reports, you'll see those definitions and similar acronyms being put into context for you. So use that information because if you read all of this information, you're gonna very easily know, does your project actually meet the things that they are going to be looking for. And if not, don't start writing. Because if you wanna you know, put a, together a 200 page project 
and then not have it read, it's a huge waste of time. And time is money because we have a scarcity of it and we have to pay for it. Um, so the other image in the background, that pile of paper, that's actually a grant solicitation I wrote. Um, that's a lot of paper to write and it's a lot easier to not write it if it's not gonna align with what your objectives are. And that doc, those documents that have all of these requirements, when you're reading them, highlight things. It's gonna be better for your own reading retention, but also when you want to share a project with multiple people on your team, if you've taken notes on the document and you've highlighted it with a methodology, it is much easier to get someone else involved. So this is the way that I personally highlight. You can use other systems, but I tend to go through and highlight if it's green, that's an opportunity or an area where we are really going to shine. Yellow is what I put for the rules where, you know, this is, make note of this because everything in yellow, I will end up making a checklist from. Orange is going to be the areas for clarification where I'm going to email the issuing agency and ask questions to make sure that I fully understand it. And then pink is information that I really need to make sure that our partners understand because there's a difference sometimes between internally what you need to know and externally what folks need to understand. So when you're doing this, evaluating the fit is really important. A great project for the wrong solicitation will not get you any money. It just won't. Um, there are a lot of grants out there and almost always you can find something that actually does align with what you need. But if you are applying for a grant that causes your team to have to do a lot of work and to work in a very specific direction and that direction is not in the same alignment with your fundamental needs, that has a real cost as well. It distracts you from your own mission. And so you wanna make sure that when you accept money from somebody to do something, that taking that work puts you in the same direction of the outcomes you wanna have and the purpose that your staff has come to work with you for. Because if you work on a bad project, it's not just that it takes your organization's time and that it doesn't necessarily align with your outcome. It can also be very demoralizing to your own staff because they don't feel like they're getting what they signed up for. And also question, are you the right recipient for this grant organization? You know, some organizations, if you're doing research, for example, um, the military has a lot of money for research. That might not align with your organization's needs in the same way that if you were to look at funding for, you know, the school districts to work on sustainable schools as opposed to sustainable Navy bases. And so understanding what lines in the sand do you have that you don't want to cross because no one can tell you that. Um, just want to pause for a second. Any questions so far? All right. Feel free to drop any questions if you've got them. Um, I'll try to pause occasionally to take them and we can have sort of more general questions at the end as well. Just a reminder for or an intro for folks who just joined us. Um, uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function, uh, which you can find on the bottom of your screen. All right, great. So one of the other things which I strongly recommend to every organization that I work with is get buy-in early. Because if I am writing a grant, I am going to be committing to a lot of different pieces. I'm going to be setting up a budget, a scope of work. And before I write anything, within my organization, I want to know who's the point person. Usually that's me as the person writing. And I will write down what is the key purpose of this grant. I'm going to make bullet points of what do we need to understand the timelines, the constraints, and the opportunities. And I'll host a meeting and make sure that other folks who have relevant opinions are able to voice their concerns early and have that buy-in. Because once you apply for the grant, if you happen to win, 
you are going to be committing a lot of resources that might impact others within your organization. If those timelines have ripple effects, you want to know that up front so that you can set up timelines within the grant that work with what you're already doing. You also want to have every opportunity that is available to talk to the agency that is giving the money or the funder because that information is a competitive advantage. A lot of times when you look at government grants, the requirements are a mixture of what the budgets will say from the legislature, as well as what are the requirements that are imposed by the agency. So if I'm applying for a grant from the California Air Resources Board, for example, there are certain mechanisms with data and reporting that are going to be set by funding. Um, so if I'm getting something that's funded by the California Climate Investments, they're going to want to know, is this a going to go into a disadvantaged community? How is this going to be reducing emissions per ton? You know, pieces like that are going to come from the funding plan, whereas other pieces such as, you know, how are we going to do the data collection are going to come from the agency. And I'm seeing a question on where to find grants. That is a great question and also one that is a little more complicated than it sounds like. Um, if you go to grants.gov, you will find thousands of grants across the federal government, but states tend to not have as organized a uh, resource where you can just find everything. Um, there are some companies that will monitor states to make sure that you can figure out, you know, from a municipal level all the way to a you know, statewide level. So the difference between if the city and county of San Francisco has a solicitation versus if the state of California has a solicitation. Um, and you can monitor it through one of those paid subscriptions. But you can also go to each of those agencies websites and request information. Almost all cities will have a tab for businesses of contracts and you can get email alerts. And so if you are monitoring on your own, it's helpful to know where do you want to work and who do you want to work with and go directly to those websites because sometimes they might release information on their own list before they link it to the larger databases. And so if that gives you an extra week or two, that time can become a competitive advantage. Almost every federal government will be listed on grants.gov. And so if you're in one of the states that doesn't have as many state resources, that would be the first place I would go to begin looking for money. Um, private foundations also are completely non-standardized. So that's gonna take a little more work. So if you're working on government grants, they're almost always going to have a template, but if there is not a template, build one. This is not the place where we wanna see your creativity in action. If the, like if you can see here on the side, this is just a sample example. Once again, uh, this is a grant that is currently available through the California Air Resources Board. The entire solicitation is actually in Excel, um, but normally you're going to look at the solicitation manual and the associated files will often include a specific template and you want to download that and use it. Also, even if you have written grants before, always go to the solicitation documents because, for example, with the California Energy Commission, I applied for and won grants multiple years in a row and every single year the templates changed. So sometimes if they discover we're not getting the data we want or this was harder to share with our graders than we expected, they'll change things and it's sort of a living process. But because it's a living process, you can't just say, I've done it once before, ergo, I know how to do it again which is why, once again, start with the instructions because every time you go to a grant that has the instructions there, you're going to know that you're starting out with relevant information. Make a checklist. So when you're doing a grant, there are so many parts to it. You're gonna have the narrative where you explain your project. You're gonna have the scope of work where you're gonna say exactly what you will do when. You're gonna have your budgets. You're gonna have your list of key personnel. And inevitably, because there are so many moving pieces, it is really, really easy to forget something, especially as you're getting closer to the end of the timeline. And so 
for me, what I do is when I'm starting the grant, I will have the instructions and you can either do this on Excel, you can make a live Google doc, you can use a piece of paper, but make a checklist of each of the parts and make sub points. So for example, the narrative, I would put a box one for this is the narrative. And then I'm gonna have sub checks of can be no more than eight pages. You know, this is the font that I need to use. This is the font size I need to use. And when I am done writing, I'm gonna go back to that checklist to make sure that I didn't accidentally do anything that puts me outside those parameters. Because by doing that check on myself, I'm not gonna submit something that is ultimately gonna get rejected. If it is possible, if your organization has one, I highly recommend getting an accountant when you are developing your budget. Because for most government agencies, what you're gonna find is that when you apply for a grant, they're going to take the budget piece and the scope of work, and if you win, they're gonna just yoink those parts and drop them directly into the contract that you will sign. And so if you know that that is going to be used in the contract, having that formatted correctly up front will save you time as well as make it easier for you to begin getting money to start the work. Um, and I see we've got a question of, are individuals less likely to get grants than organizations? That is a great question. It really depends on the solicitation. Um, most governments, grants are going to be geared towards organizations because they have multiple parts. Um, and if you are an individual applying for that, it's a lot harder to receive it, but there are a variety of grant types. So for example, some grants will say you have to be a nonprofit to receive money. And if you're a private company and the, the way you would do that then is you would approach an organization that is a nonprofit and say, I'd like to work with you. If you know, for example, that you are capable of doing the work that there's a government grant for, and it says only organizations can apply, approach that organization. Um, you know, local air districts, for example, in the climate space often are the umbrella organization which will receive money from the federal government and then have subcontractors who are local individuals doing work. So if you bring a grant proposal to such an organization, a lot of times you're going to end up ghostwriting it for them. And then when they win the money, they will give you the money um, to do the work, but do some of that reporting on the federal side. Um, doo -doo -doo. Sorry, there's a really long question. Um, one moment. Uh, will we need a accountant for smaller budgets? Uh, generally not. Uh, those smaller grants are much easier to administer and depending on the program, it will vary the requirements, but at least in the state of California, anything less than $100,000 is considered a minor contract. And so you will work directly with the project manager from the organization and you don't need additional resources, but anything above $100,000 is usually going to have some accounting. Um, so, I see that, you know, there's a question from David about, you know, civil disobedience. You will likely never get grant money from the government for civil disobedience, um, specifically because the government is not going to advocate for you breaking laws. Um, foundations are also usually trying to stay within nonprofit tax rules, and so they will likely not fund that. You're more likely to get resources for civil disobedience through processes like mutual aid and having individual donors um, fund you than you are through a process like this, unfortunately. Um, how do you figure out a pay scale for your work when it's for a nonprofit or cause? Uh, great question. Um, I would look at what are comparable market rates in the area that you are working in? So for example, um, when I have done grants, if we've got engineering work, I will look at what are the rates for a union electrician? And usually I will multiply that 
by 30%. And the reason for that is there's going to be some overhead necessary to do the work. And by the time you apply for a grant, it's been graded, the contract's been signed, there might have been inflation. So when you're doing your actual billing, you're going to get reimbursed for the direct amount you spent, not for the amount that was in your initial budget. So there is room for wiggle room there. Um, in terms of, you know, if you end up hiring somebody who gets paid $40 an hour and you thought it might take $50 an hour, um, you can only ask for reimbursement for that $40 an hour because that's what they're actually being paid. But if you think that in order to get this done, it might take more, ask for the amount that you want. And if you need less, use less. But if you ask for less, it, let's say you say, I think it'll cost $40 and it turns out the professional who can do that charges $50 an hour, you're never gonna get that $10 back after the initial award. Uh, they will rarely give you more money to do the same work. They will happily keep some money left over in the pot. Uh, if you wanna figure out ways to research what some of those numbers could be, um, you know, companies like Glassdoor that have pay scales on them, you can just honestly Google it, see if those rates, but also you can ask around. So if, for example, you see online that, you know, this is the rate that some folks get paid and that doesn't seem like what you would need to have somebody get a living wage to do that work, then change the number. Um, I definitely, when, you know, writing grants, would look at what people should be getting paid to do the work. And if that was higher than what we were able to pay previously, then it's like, okay, I'm gonna apply for where we should be. And if they accept it, I now have money to increase the salaries of those individuals and pay them their actual worth and make sure that for the scope of this project, they are getting paid an appropriate amount. Um, and I think that sort of question of what is a living wage and what is a fair wage is something that is different sometimes in regions based on cost of living. But um, I think that's something that goes to a broader question of pay equity. Um, happy to answer more specifically if you want to email me after the session. So I'm going to now start on questions as they relate to writing the actual grant. So when you're writing, you need to assume that your reader is a smart person, but also that they know absolutely nothing about your work because you are only graded on what is within the pages. So if there's a sort of general idea of social equity exists, um, but you don't call out how your project advances social equity, then it is really hard to get bonus points in the grading for that project accomplishing that outcome if you have not explicitly said so. I just, um, I've got a question from if Eric, if grantors rarely give out additional money to cover expenses after the initial award, does it mean it is unlikely we could receive additional funding to allow for scaling up operations or bringing on more collaborative partners? So you could do that project in a subsequent grant award, but you will likely not get it within the initial grant. Uh, because normally the way that grants are written is through a budget year. So if if I'm thinking about the fiscal year 2020, 2021, and I've said we're going to have X amount of money, and knowing I have X amount of money, I give out awards to three or four different projects, and each of them is getting Y amount. If they now want to get an increase of money, and I don't, if X pool didn't change, just because you wanted more money, it does not mean the amount of money in my pocket has increased. And so because of that, if you think you're going to need more money, you need to ask up front so that in the award process, you're going to get the amount that you need. And so if you think I'm going to need two subcontractors to help me, write that into the initial solicitation. Ask for your wish list. If the project is really good and they don't have enough money, sometimes they will negotiate with you with a question of can we do a partial award and cover some of the costs. But if you, you know, get awarded to have one subcontractor and you really needed two, they will rarely give you additional money. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the question of what to do when you are writing. You wanna keep it simple. So this is not the place to use flowery language. This is the place to tell people we are doing 
X project for Y reason, and it will help you accomplish Z outcome. Now, if you're writing these things, cite your sources. So if you're doing calculations on what is your cost benefit analysis, point to the modeling that you're using, show your work. That basic ability to have accountability makes it really easy for the grader to trust you. And you always wanna circle back to what are the grading criteria that you noticed in the instructions. Because if I am the grader of a project and my job is to read the narrative, I might, you know, let's say we've got a packet this big of 200 pages. I might only be reading 20 pages of narrative and I'm gonna read the 20 pages of narrative for 10 different projects. Now, if I'm reading 10 different projects, I want to see as I'm going down how it addresses the grading criteria and I wanna make sure that it's in there. Meanwhile, there might be somebody else on the same grading team who is looking only at the budgets. And so you wanna have all of the information in every section so that if they divide the packet with multiple graders, each piece is being graded well. So for example, when I was doing a project to get funding for school buses, in the narrative, I said, we are going to get 10 school buses. In the executive summary, I said, we are going to build 10 school buses. In the grant application for the budget, under equipment, I put school buses, had the amount, number of units, 10. In the scope of work, I have the timeline saying, the first five school buses will be here, the next five school buses will be there. And on one hand, if you were reading that entire grant as a single unit, you might say, oh my God, I have seen this information five times. But the graders are not seeing the information five times, they're seeing it once in the relevant section. And so it's really important that you remember what is the grading criteria, that you've kept it simple, and you're continuing to point out exactly how you are solving that problem. Now, if you know that you are going to apply for a project this year, be prepared because there's a lot of information that is going to be needed. And if you are prepared, you can save yourself time and rapidly respond to things because you've already got some of the pieces together. Now, if Disney did not have copyright enforcement, I would definitely yoink a photo from Scar uh, from the Lion King and just make you think, be prepared, because that is a secret weapon. So does your organization already have a mission statement or company background? Do you have team bios or a bio for yourself? Do you have your headshot? Do you have an up-to-date resume that you can attach to the project? If you've got partners that you want to work with, do you have all of their contact information? Do you have your tax ID? Uh, if you are applying to federal government, do you have your DUNS number? Do you have a list of all the facilities that you could have access to? And specifically, you know, what is the rent on those facilities if you were needing to get reimbursed to use them in a different way? And do you have a list of every past project that you have won? Now, I want you to remember that list of successful past projects because that is the reference point of I have gotten money before, I will do great again. And if you have not gotten grants before, there is a reason I said past projects. If you've worked with somebody else and did a great job, you want to reference the experience you have and make sure that the issuing agency knows that you are a trustworthy source of information who is accountable and will help them achieve their outcome. And some of this information is always going to be useful when you're writing a business plan, if you're applying to get money, if you're trying to work with new foundations. And so if you've got HR or office manager to keep these files up to date, if you've got new hires and you want to collect that information, that can save you a lot of time later. But also, it can be recycled. Um, so clarification question, when we say, a list of facilities, do you mean venues, other orgs or funders? So let's say for example, that you know within this project, we are going to need to have stakeholder meetings and we want to get together a bunch of different people in our community. The facilities that you have access to could be, we already have a conference room and we can invite people to use it. It could be our 
company has Zoom subscriptions and are able to host, it can be, uh, you know, do you have computers that you can send out so that if we cannot meet in person, uh, there's contingency plans. It could be, we have a relationship with a community resource center down the street that is able to grant us access to this space. Uh, all of those things that you have access to, you want to call out. But if you don't have access to them, if you said, we don't have a conference room and we know we would need to rent one from a hotel, then you want to include that you need that in your budgets because either you have the resource or you need the resource. And you kind of have to go in that sort of binary piece when you're building a budget. So thanks for your question. Uh, one of the other things to remember with being prepared is that all of these documents are very useful to learn from. So let's say I apply to one grant this year and I don't win. I can usually ask that issuing agency for feedback on the project. So if you, for example, apply to a Department of Energy grant with a concept paper, even if they reject your project, they will usually send you a summary of this piece did not meet our scoring criteria, this piece did well. Agencies that don't send that out, like the California Energy Commission, you're allowed to request a meeting after the solicitation is closed with those staff. So I have had meetings with agencies about grants that I didn't win. And they said, you know, your team bios are great. Your company bio was great. Those areas scored really well. But this piece, you didn't get enough points. Knowing that, I basically just highlighted those portions for the next time I applied for a grant because now I know I can recycle that portion and get five points out of five points and I don't have to think about it. Whereas the area where we didn't score well, we're gonna redevelop that. Remember, this is not grad school. We are not in academia anymore. Plagiarism is not a problem if you are using your own company or organization's resources and you reuse it. In fact, that is a huge asset. So I see that a lot of you have written press releases before. When you think about a press release and you know we summarize this point really well and everybody in the organization already agreed that was a great summary, great, reuse that. There's no need to creatively tell me something that you've already written somewhere clearly before. So if I'm trying to write a grant really quickly and we've got press releases based on past similar projects, I will yoink the language that is relevant to my project so that I'm not having to do as much original writing. And if it is still true, you can use it. So if I wrote my bio for another project, I don't want to rewrite my bio. So even for Netroots, you know, I had a bio written for a company that I'm a board advisor with. I didn't rewrite my bio. I just copied my bio and reused it because I'm still the same person. Within your organization, if your mission statement hasn't changed, don't try to rework it. All of those little areas where you can save time will make the process much more streamlined. So get the help that you need. Um, and when I say get help, it's not just saying, hey, can you help me out? A lot of it is getting validation from people who already agree and work with you. So if I am writing a grant, I want to get as many letters of support to attach as support letters to my grant application so that when the grader is reading it, they know I am relevant. So I will pre-write these. So for example, if I want to ask Nancy Pelosi's office to support my grant project to get additional funding in San Francisco, her office will happily send a support letter, but their staff is really busy. So if I pre-write it as, we are asking your support for this particular project, here's how it will help our district, here's the amount of money we are asking for, can you just drop this onto your letterhead and sign off? They are almost likely, almost immediately going to get back to me. And if I don't do that and they have to put staff time, they might get back to me to two to three weeks later. So if you know that I want to get somebody on the school board to write a support letter, I want to get a person I know at another nonprofit to write a support letter, all of those partners have so many other things going on that if you pre-write things and ask them, hey, can you just sign off on this? You will get a much higher rate of 
support coming in in those support letters. And those support letters do make a difference because when you are grading a grant, you are very risk adverse. You want to give money to somebody who will solve the problem that you have identified and you want to make sure that they are going to be good at it. And if you get a letter of support, you're getting a testimonial from somebody who says, yeah, they're going to be safe. The more letters of support, the better you're going to do. So even if, you know, within the grant application, it might say, you know, reference letters and contacts, and it'll ask you for, give me three names and email addresses for people we can contact with questions. You want to follow the rules there, only give three. But in the additional documents that you attach to, are there any additional resources? If you have 20 different support letters, that makes you look really good. And people don't necessarily think about that all the time. So got a question from Janice. Do you ask them first if they want a pre-written letter? Do you give them the option of write it yourself or just sign off on the letter? So for me, what I tend to do is if it's a partner that I know really well, I'll go to their website look at their mission statement, yoink those pieces of, you know, here at the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, we do X, Y, Z. And this project from our organization is doing ABC actions. We support this because it aligns with our mission of insert. And then sincerely name. And I just write that out in a Word doc and send it over along as an attachment with a request where I will say, if you are able to sign on, I've attached a sample letter that you can just sign and put on your letterhead mm -hmm. where you've made it really easy. If they have the time to write their own, they often will, but almost always if you pre-write it and you use their own language from their own website, it will tend to get accepted. And so this gives you an advantage of making sure that all of your rec letters are of a higher quality level. But that's a great question. Also, these testimonials don't just need to be from organizations. So I have gotten individuals who are experts in my space who have worked with me before and said, hey, can you sign off on this? And I've gotten letters from individuals who have that, you know, experience. So if your organization has worked with folks, you know, maybe you've worked with an environmental justice coalition and you've got local activists, getting an activist letter of support as well as a you know, local congressperson, that combination shows that you have legitimacy. So I strongly urge getting those folks. Elected officials will almost always sign on in support if you're getting money for their district. So if you're doing a project where you've got stakeholders in multiple areas, ask the city council person, ask your congressperson, ask your state assembly person. All of those things go a long ways. So if I've got a timeline for how to add, approach a project, there's sort of the pre-solicitation where before the solicitation is released from an agency, usually you know that it's coming because the budget has to get passed by the legislature in government programs. And if it's something like a foundation that has reoccurring funding cycles, they often let you know that information in advance. So before there's a solicitation for me to apply to, I'm gonna start building those common resources. I'm gonna get the bios available for my team. I'm gonna make sure that we know what's going on and what the investment plans are coming from these agencies. And I'm gonna do some of that relationship building so that when it comes time to ask for a support letter, I've already got a list of people I can go to. Once the solicitation is released, that's when I'm gonna bust out with my highlighters, read the instructions. I'm gonna ask all those clarifying questions and I'm going to hold internal meetings to align everybody to understand what are we doing and what. Before we apply, we all have to agree that what we are doing is in the interest of the organization. That's the point where we're going to say, I'm going to designate a point person who owns this project. If there's something where you need information from multiple people, having one person be the quarterback helps a lot. They're the person who owns that checklist. And on this project, they're gonna delegate their responsibilities, set internal deadlines and request support letters. So an example of an internal timeline is, let's say our sales team is working on something or you know, we've got a bunch of other events that are near the same time period that we're working on. 
if we've got contingencies that we need to check on before we apply, we want to make sure that those are considered prior to application and that we make a no-go decision of we're either going to move forward or we're not with enough time for everybody in the org to do their best work. And so internally set that deadline. And that's going to be before you've actually applied. You also want to have an internal review. So if I'm going to say, here's the timeline for the work, I want to make sure that everybody in my organization has reviewed that timeline and says, yeah, that's workable. Because if I let the funding agency have more buy-in than my own team, that is going to hurt morale and make people resent the project. And when people resent a project, they will not do their best work and they will also feel like they are handicapped in their ability to do other work internally because you might have shifted the priorities. Once you've done that internal work and you've pulled together your application, when you're planning to submit an application, plan to do it at least a day before the deadline. The government servers that you upload files to are incredibly slow. I have had it take more than six hours to submit a grant before because so many people are applying that their servers are just overwhelmed. And so if you know that that's the case, just do it a day earlier. You don't want to miss out on an application because it took too long. And when they say you have to submit something by 5 p.m. on this day, they mean it. If you apply at 5.01, they will not accept it. For me, if I was running late and it had a piece of, you know, there's some grants that you can submit either in person or online. If I was running late, I would sometimes print everything out and physically drive to drop things off at that agency to make sure that it would get in on time. Uh, then we have the waiting game. There is a gap between when you submit an application and when awards are announced. So have some tea, don't stress about it. Don't do any anxiety because if you win it, great. But if you didn't, some of that work of internal alignment will still be valuable to your organization. Now, when an agency issues a notice of proposed awards or a NOPA, that is not a contract. That is a, these are the people we intend to give money to. But we still have to negotiate and have a contract signing. And so that is actually still going to be a process. So who has the legal authority to sign off on that? Maybe only your executive director can do that. Maybe you have the authority yourself to do it. Whatever the case is, make sure that you've designated a point person and also set a deadline for plans changing. So if it took them three months to grade and in their initial timeline, they said it would take them one month, that two month gap might mean that you need to change other pieces of the project and you need to negotiate that in the award phase as opposed to in the writing phase. So at that point, you're gonna go into getting the contract and the work done. And this is not just take the money and go. There's almost always some level of, we need to get these permits or if we are doing something that physical, like you know, for me in the EV space, that means we need to get permits on electric usage. We need to get a contractor. Um, if you're doing something where it's more analysis based, you're going to need to set up what are your reporting functions? How are you tracking your hours so that you can accurately bill? All of those pieces will require usually some systems updates. And so you want to make sure that that is built into the work function. And a good grant application for me is a three part thing. It gives you internal clarity. It allows you to update your documentation and it also allows you to have people practice good management. That is a skill that will apply to many projects. So sometimes even if you don't win the money, you are building skill sets internally that will help you. It also allows you in the process of asking for recommendation letters and sending out those pre-written letters to further build your relationships with partners and to remind them, this is what we are doing and why. The reason that's really important is sometimes in the process of getting those letters, Partners who might not have thought about how that work is being done might see an opportunity to help you in other ways. So I have definitely approached previous sales targets with asking them for letters of support from past projects and been able to create new openings for new sales and new projects through a different application that did not involve them. So make sure that you're considering those opportunities and how to align them with your existing work so that if you're not going to win, you still win 
other things. And then if you do win the grant, there's money. Hey, Irvi, uh, so um, just the time check, it's 4.53, the room will close in about uh, seven minutes or six Great. minutes, five. yeah. Great, I am almost on the last slide, so this is excellent. So did you remember the instructions and did you follow them? Check the checklist. Um, especially for online grant applications, things like using the wrong font can be an automatic thing because you can basically glance at it and they use Times New Roman instead of Arial, reject. It might seem silly to say, okay, if you have one extra page or the wrong font, why would you reject that? But remember those instructions. They have told you what they need and why. It is in your interest to listen. Don't be one of the projects that gets rejected for stupid reasons. And good luck. Uh, there is a lot of grant money out there and not all of these funding pools have a lot of applicants. There are some pools of money that do, but there are some applications that I've submitted where I was one of seven applying for it. And I still won multiple millions of dollars because I looked for those projects up front. So take a look, not just at the grants.gov, but look at your local agencies and ask them what's coming up. Because if you know there's an area where work is needing to be done, you can be the one to do it and do it effectively in a way that best represents your community. And if you want to follow up, my email is urvi at climatesolutionconsulting.com. Feel free to email me any questions, but right now I'm just going to move into a general open question space. So if you've got any questions, feel free, not just on what was in the slides, but also any general questions. So I've got a question from Janice. What type of local agencies would you suggest we look at? Um, that would really depend on what your project is. So if you, for example, are in the healthcare space, um, does your Department of Health have projects? If you're focused on youth health, do your school districts have money relating to youth health? Or is that something that's only gonna come from your Department of Health? Um, are you looking at the county level as well as the um, state level? Are you looking at the federal level? Um, it's gonna vary by project. So for me, I work in the sustainability space. Most of the grant money that I've gotten has been from the California Energy Commission and the California Air Resources Board, but I also monitor things like the Department of Energy. Um, I look at things from the EPA, but it's going to vary by what is the work you are doing. Any other questions? Looks like we don't have any right now, but feel free to drop them in. Um, can I repeat my email? Sure. It is urvi at climatesolutionconsulting.com. Um, and Emily, if you could just drop in that link for people to um, give their information. If you've got any questions um, or you want a copy of the slides, Emily's going to be dropping a link in. And I can, when I send those slides out, you'll have my email um, and that'll hopefully allow you to ask any follow-up questions that might come to you later. Is there any list of private funds for grants? Um, there are, and they differ by funding pools. And so honestly, Googling with, you know, if you're an artist and you look for arts grants on Google, you're gonna start to find things. Um, use your own network. If there are folks you've seen doing great work, ask them, how did you get funding for that? Um, I know people can be a little more guarded with their relationships with big dollar donors, but a lot of the times with grants, people want to talk about their work because that is public information for most agencies and private foundations. Um, but you know, it's one of those things that discovery is definitely part of the process. And that's why I tried to make sure that research piece was covered. Um, do I know any funding resources for startups? That is a great question. Um, once again, it's going to really depend on what exactly your startup is doing. So for example, if you are a startup in the energy space, there's a program here in California called CalSeed, which provides seed funding at really early stages, which would be great if, you know, if you're a college student who's trying to start something in the energy space. That's not going to be the same answer for if you're a healthcare startup. Um, you know, there are 
a lot of startup incubators that I would look to in terms of that those tend to be more investment where they're going to want some stock. But if you look at their events and who attends, a lot of times agencies and foundations will attend other industry events so that they've got a current working knowledge mm -hmm. to be able to assess the state of technology relevant to the applications that they are grading. And so looking around in the room for who's there without an interest in participating, um, because there often are those folks. So for me in the climate space, I go to different conferences and I will look around at who's not in a booth and talk to those folks, because a lot of times that's a way to find resources. And we've got two minutes left, so we might be able to take one or two more questions if you enter those now. Um, and I realize that it might have seemed like a lot of information, and so I just want to emphasize again, the most important thing you can do is follow the instructions if they are given. And if there are no instructions given, then Google the people you are going to be working with do that background research. Because if you know, for example, that this foundation has given money to five projects before, and what is the commonality in these five projects? If you address that in your narrative of similar to the work of this company, we are doing X, Y, Z. Calling out those past successes of those programs reduces the risk of saying yes to you. And so one of the things that I like to think about when I'm applying for a government grant is, the project manager who is going to manage these grants is more likely to get promoted if their portfolio of grants is all successful. And so I want to prove to them that I'm going to be the project that gets them a promotion. Because if I reduce the risk and their personal concern, it helps them. I also like to call out the research I've done. So for example, if I'm writing a grant about environmental justice, I will specifically point to as the governor said in his executive order, I will point to those directives that the legislature has set so that they know that I am addressing the funding pool and that I am going to align with where their portfolio goes. So, uh, sorry, this is a long question, important. Um, yes, I would say there is some important differences in application approaches for funding to target single orgs or coalition projects. In a coalition project, you're going to want to have a lead organization that is going to be the one contracting with the granting agency and then have them have subcontracts with all of the other orgs. Because if your grant project manager at the DOE has to approach five people, that is going to take them more time than if they have to contact you and you contact five people. And so in that case, you want to issue a grant on your cover page. You're going to say this is the lead organization. And each of those sub organizations, you're going to want to include bios for. You're going to want to include some of their examples of past success. And you're going to want to prove that there is a method of integrating that work in the scope of work. Because if, for example, I've got a grant project that needs an electrician in Fresno to build infrastructure, for a vehicle that I'm building in Detroit that is then going to be driving around in Fresno, I want to be able to call out in my application, how is the work there going to be managed as opposed to the work in a different state? And how is that information going to be consolidated and shared with the issuing agency? Because I don't want that issuing agency to have to go and chase down multiple partners. And so if you've got collaborative projects, who is the facilitator? And you want to name that and you want to say how you're going to work together because just because you are aligned in your interest up front does not mean that you are aligned in your reporting. So if you're going to have to write monthly and quarterly reports, who is going to be the person who says, how are we doing? What's the scorecard? And then send that information in. And hopefully that answers your question, Eric. All right. It looks like we are, is, wait, are we a, Ending at 2.30 or at 2? Uh, at, at 2 or 5. Yeah, so we're actually a few minutes over, it looks like. Okay, I'm sorry for uh, taking a little more of your time. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to email me. I'm also the Urv, 
So T-H-E-U-R-V on Twitter. Uh, feel free to randomly chit chat with me there. And I hope you have a great Netroots and look forward to seeing you in person when it's safe. Have a great rest of your day. Woohoo. All right. Thank you much.